All right, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so thanks for joining AKS Office Hours. Uh, for those of you new, uh, who are we? Uh, my name's Dave Strabel. I work on what's called our uh, Global Black Belt team on the cloud native side. Uh, essentially, we have a really cool name, uh, but what we do is we focus primarily on uh, a smaller set of uh, technologies within Azure. Uh, my focus area is around Kubernetes and the open source ecosystem. Uh, you can connect with me uh, on Twitter at Dave underscore Strabel. Uh, Kindle, who is usually hosting, uh, is actually out today, uh, so she'll be back next time. Uh, so anybody new to office hours, uh, why we do AKS office hours is really to provide our uh, you know, customers with updates pertaining uh, to AKS, but also uh, things within that kind of Kubernetes and cloud native ecosystem. Uh, we tend to host a, sh a talk or demo around cloud native technologies and how they relate to Kubernetes and AKS, but it's also time to collect feedback from customers. Uh, you know, bring up your issues, any blockers, you know, use cases you have, uh, any type of questions related to AKS is a time you can ask. We usually try to set some time at the end for just general uh, questions. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of us on the call from Microsoft that have experience in AKS, uh, others from my um, uh, team uh, within GBB. So feel free to ask questions in the chat too, and we'll try to get to those. Uh, so what you can expect, uh, today we'll go over probably about 10 minutes uh, around AKS and ecosystem updates. There's not a lot uh, of updates since our last call. Uh, today I'm going to do something a little different, uh, is try to have more of an interactive conversation around kind of CICD with Kubernetes. Uh, I'll take you through some of the stuff we do with like GitHub Actions and a lot of questions we get from customers of things that they should be putting in kind of their CI/CD pipelines. Uh, how do you think about security within CI pipelines? Uh, what are kind of those steps that you need to really look at? Uh, so I, I will say it's not like a walled out plan and not totally structured uh, uh, like presentation style, but just a few things I think we should go through that uh, we get a lot of questions around uh, from our customers. Uh, and then we'll probably leave more time for the ask us anything today uh, and get kind of, you know, if you have things, items you have feedback on or, you know, areas you're struggling with. Uh, like I said, we have a there's a lot of experience on this call from our customers and uh, from Microsoft employees also on this call. Uh, so feel free to, you know, bring up any question. There's no dumb questions on this call. Uh, everybody has a little different experience and where they are at with Kubernetes and AKS. Uh, so feel free to bring up those calls because uh, there's a lot of uh, exceptional people on this call that have a lot of experience that can help you out. Uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, that Office Hours is primarily hosted by the Global Black Belt team, uh, but uh, a lot of our different sessions are ran by our product groups. Uh, we tend to try to you know, keep a steady stream of um, product groups uh, and kind of more new stuff they're kind of working on uh, to come in. And we also do like a month or uh, bi-monthly uh, roadmap update on here too. Uh, recordings and content will all be available on the GitHub link. And if you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, and you just want to send them to us, uh, there's always AKS office hours at Microsoft.com. You can send those too. Uh, so AKS updates so release notes for here uh one of the things is 1.18 based on some of the customer feedback will be extending some limited support uh for that out to july 31st uh with limited support uh mainly what this is going to get you if you're kind of not that place to upgrade to newer releases yet uh, will be creation of new clusters and node pools still on on 118 uh, past what our cutoff date was of I think uh, at the end of June. Uh, you will be able to uh, still create new clusters and node pools on 118 and also any type of update operations on uh, those 1.18 clusters. 
Uh, if there's things around like uh, new patches to that and all that, you'll be asked to upgrade to supported versions. So it is kind of more of a limited support. Uh, but if you're, you know, kind of in that uh, spot where you're not ready to upgrade to uh, 119 or 1.20, uh, then uh, you will have limited support that we'll still provide for those. Uh, PSP, so pod security policy deprecation. This one, I think we bring up every time, but I think it's important because we do have a lot of customers that have uh, implemented pod security policies or are looking to. Uh, Kubernetes upstream will be deprecating that beginning with Kubernetes 1.21. Uh, and the API will be removed in 1.25. Um, for any preview features this time, public DNS support for private clusters using the private cluster endpoint. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of new preview features. Uh, a lot of those fell before uh, our last meeting we talked about uh, with build and all of that uh, around that time frame. Uh, so that is the wrong slide there. Ecosystem updates. Uh, it's going to be that time again to plan for uh, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, North America. They will be doing, the plan is to have it on site in Los Angeles. Uh, so that'll be October 11th through the 15th uh, with the main conference, October 13th through the 15th. Uh, the other pre-event programming, these are usually pre-events uh, that different companies put on. Uh, really good events to go to. So I'd plan, if you plan on going, I'd plan on being out there from the 11th to the 15th. Uh, it will also be virtual though, uh, for, you know, some people are probably not comfortable, you know, going together at these big conferences and that too. So uh, they will be uh, providing a virtual experience like they have uh, the last few. Uh, one announcement, this kind of came out uh, and I, I totally forgot about it, so I was actually dabbling in it and signed up for it. Uh, but Buoyant Cloud is, has a kind of a managed offering for, if you don't know who Buoyant uh, is, they were the creators of Linkerd, uh, uh, the service mesh. Uh, they have a new offering that is in like a public kind of preview state. Uh, that you can go sign up for uh, and get connected up. Um, but it is uh, more of a uh, management for uh, the Linkerd service mesh uh, deployment. It tracks a lot of different of uh, the your data plane, control plane health, uh, just life cycle of applications and uh, kind of brings all those under uh, you know, a single pane of glass there. Uh, so definitely go check that up. You can sign up for free there. Uh, if you, uh, I'll try. I'll try to put a link uh, in the chat for it. But they're also having some, uh, I believe, next week, uh, some virtual uh, announcement on it, and we'll go through it more in depth of like what it actually provides. Uh, but it's really easy to get set up with. If you have a Kubernetes cluster, you can go sign up for it. Uh, essentially, gives you a pre-built YAML file to get your uh, cluster connected up to it. Um, so check that out. Uh, capsule release 0 0.5.0. .0, so they're on their way to G to a stable or GA state, uh, however they call it. Uh, if you've not heard of Capsule, uh, what it provides is really to help uh, implementing multi-tenancy on top of Kubernetes. Uh, as if any of you've tried to implement multi-tenancy on top of Kubernetes, it can kind of be a pain. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, but uh, uh, a lot of it's kind of manual things that you have to implement. Uh, the, the cool thing about Capsule I found was that you can set a lot of different policy base, uh, a lot of different policies like uh, for multi-tenancy and how that trickles down and it automates a lot of that. Uh, so definitely check out Capsule. It's really easy to get started with, uh, which was cool. But uh, there's a lot of policy-based stuff that you can set in your environment to kind of more enable uh, and support multi-tenancy within Kubernetes. All right, CI/CD with Kubernetes, and 
the cool thing, I have zero slides. That's not actually a slide there. Uh, so we get a lot of questions around, uh, especially around CI pipelines. Uh, so your continuous integration, like what are those different steps that you use within a actual CI CD pipeline? Let me, there. That should look a little better, uh, hopefully. Uh, so we get a lot of these questions around, like, what are those different steps that I need to add in there? Because there's a lot of things you can do within a CI pipeline. Uh, one of the easiest ways to get started, if you want to see kind of like what the very basic of delivering a application through a CI CD pipeline uh, within AKS, one of the things you can do that a lot of customers actually don't even know is here, uh, and, and it's changed a little, but if I go to my Kubernetes services here, uh, we will check out, we'll do this one. There is this little thing called Deployment Center that's in preview here, and it's probably not something talked about much because I don't think I've really heard much about it. Uh, what I can do within the Deployment Center here is, let's go ahead and add a uh, project here. Here I will select GitHub as my repository. Uh, this could be fun, we'll see. Because I have a bunch of multi, okay, it just worked. Uh, we'll pick one. I think I have way too many repositories here. I know one of these at baseline. Okay, we'll do the master branch. Looks at your repository, so it found a Docker file within uh, this repository. Uh, this Docker file, then I can say it says like what port it's exposed on. Just take some stuff from that Docker file that it analyzed there. Uh, here I'm just going to do next. Namespace, I can say I can use the existing one uh, in my cluster, or I can just use a create new one. We'll create a new one here. Uh, our container registry. Obviously, you can use one you already have here. So I'm using the Azure Container Registry. Uh, when I hit done, within those few steps, what this goes out and does is configures continuous delivery for my application to uh, my AKS cluster. And since that one's still creating, I will check one of these other ones because it actually is probably better to look at. Let's see if it's deploying a few seconds ago. Okay. Uh, and this will actually even take you into the, the workloads tab on here uh, from directly within that uh, space here. The one that I want to show here. is what it actually goes out and creates for you. Okay, that was not what I wanted. Okay, so we'll go back within the deployment center. I guess I should have logged into a lot of this stuff. Okay, so what this did was built a action for me. Uh, you'll see this deploy to AKS. That's what it actually created. These other ones are things I already, uh, GitHub actions I already had within here. This one is actually adding the work the workflow file here. So if I go back to my code, where you find these workflow is right under this uh, folder structure here. So the one it deployed would be this one. So this automatically builds out uh, a few different tasks for you from uh, logging into Docker to building and pushing that image into Azure Container Registry for you, setting the context. Uh, so here when it asked to create a namespace, if I wanted to do a new one, if I didn't say, hey, I want a new namespace, it wouldn't uh, contain this step. It would just set the context. Uh, and use the namespace to deploy to. It's also setting this secret, which it doesn't necessarily need if you had your uh, AKS cluster wired up to ACR already, uh, but it does create this secret for uh, your container registry. 
uh, and then uses uh, this action, uh, this Kate's action to deploy the different manifests uh, for you. Uh, so it builds out all of that for you. So it's a very easy way to really get started uh, with continuous delivery uh, to AKS. <laughs> Uh, but that's great for kind of the, you know, getting started and good starting point. When we start thinking about uh, from like a production standpoint of like some of the stuff we want to include within our CI and our continuous delivery pipelines, that's going to be um, a lot more advanced. Uh, so I'm going to show here kind of some of the things that we think about and, you know, discuss with customers of things that should be added into kind of your continuous integration, um, you know, also from like different things like end-to-end -end testing within your CIA CD pipelines. So one of the things um, in every pipeline you're going to find, um, we check out our code here. Uh, so this uh, triggers off master. Uh, on And within GitHub Actions, you can trigger things on uh, different events. So this one is on a push to master. Uh, you could trigger this on a schedule. You could trigger it based on all kinds of different uh, events. Uh, we can set different environmental variables in here. So when we get to the meat of it, uh, you know, is building that image is going to be one thing that we run in here. One of the things that you also want to make sure of when you in your CI pipeline is that you start moving things that you may have done later in the cycle. Uh, move those, see where you can move those into, you know, closer to an end user so they get a better feedback loop. So for instance, if you have a vulnerable image, uh, why even push that to a Docker registry for then, you know, if you're doing registry scanning, then it gets flagged. Do that scanning uh, up front. Here I'm using Aquasex Trivi uh, that does a vulnerability scan on my image here. Um, Microsoft is coming out with a uh, static vulnerability scanner that you would be able to put in place here. Uh, but Trivi is just a open source project from Aqua Security that you can use. It already has a GitHub action out there. Uh, essentially, it's just looking at these environmental variables, so my registry uh, and the app, uh, the Docker build I did here with the app name. Uh, and don't use the latest tag. Uh, what this should actually be, you would want to use something like, uh, like the git sha. So you could do, within here, you can do like git and sha, and it will tag it with the git sha with that. Uh, I use latest just for demo purposes because it made uh, a few things easier for me. Uh, so once it passes this security scan, then we can push it into our registry because we know now that we do have a secure image. Uh, it doesn't have vulnerabilities introduced into it. One of the other things I think is important also, um, and this I will say like, uh, this wasn't a total complex where you may have some of this that lives outside the apps, um, uh, the, so the source code. Uh, some of these like uh, workflows may live outside of the source code. Um, a lot of people wanted to break up like configuration from source code uh, just based on separation of duties and that. Uh, one thing you can also do, one of the tools I love is called ConfTest. It can use, oh, sorry about that. It can use open policy agent uh, to evaluate uh, so that you can essentially set policies and evaluate uh, your Kubernetes manifest or Helm charts. Uh, so I'll show an example of what we've done there. Uh, this one I'm continuing on air because it would just broke kind of this whole demo. Uh, continue on air, it's just saying, hey, continue on with uh, this pipeline, even though this is going to air out because I set a policy violation, uh, which we will look at. Uh, then also in my integration testing here, I'm using KIND. If you don't know what KIND is, it stands for Kubernetes and Docker. Um, but it's a very lightweight uh, Kubernetes that runs within Docker. Uh, so this here, 
Uh, if you did kind cluster create, if you downloaded kind, you can do kind cluster create and it'll go create a Kubernetes cluster for you uh, that will have a, a multi-node, uh, it'll be multi-node and multi, uh, there'll be multi-control plane nodes also. But why I'm doing this is essentially so that it's going to test my deployment at least to make sure it can deploy, it can pull down the image that, that it can actually run. Here I may also, you know, perform some other task that I may want in here to do testing. Like I may want to check and make sure, you know, uh, like I can actually hit the cluster IP and those type of things that you could put into this testing deployment. Uh, I've seen others where they do a more full on kind of test where they'll actually, instead of doing this within uh, kind, that they'll actually deploy an AKS cluster uh, when they do that integration testing, which is totally fine too. Uh, some will do this it's because it's going to be much faster within that CI pipeline. Uh, I believe this takes about a minute and a half to spin up actually. Uh, so those are a few of the things that uh, we typically think about is moving a lot of these things uh, to get into your continuous integration. Because if you look at uh, multiple things I pointed out here, like Trivi, the vulnerability scan, uh, you can do vulnerability scans within the registry, but I already have to push a vulnerable image there. I rather, you know, my end users, when they're trying to get their application built and deployed, that they get that feedback much sooner within the loop and not later on. Um, even with like the policy violations, we can do that with Azure. We can evaluate those with Azure policy and Azure policy still fits a need, uh, but we can you know, do those policy violations because this conf test uses open policy agent. It can use the same type of policies that you use in Azure policy for Kubernetes, but now I can get a better feedback loop to the end user uh, so they know the things that they need to change uh, early on. So what I'll go ahead and do here uh, is trigger my actions. Oh, wrong project. Here we go. Uh, actions. Uh, oh, we're going to do this a different way because I forgot there's one that I want to change uh, so that you can actually see what we're doing here. Is Okay, we're going to change this so that we actually do get a policy uh, violation. All right, so we'll push us since this uh, CI workflow is based on pushing to master. Uh, this is asking. Okay. There we go. So we should see, all right, uh, since I just pushed to master here, we now see in the progress here. We'll see that it goes through the one thing I want to show here should run pretty quickly. Uh, the one thing that, like I mentioned, like kind does take a little bit of time to, uh, to run and get set up. Uh, it, takes usually about a minute and a half to two minutes. So why this is running, uh, uh, just questions from the crowd. Uh, is anybody use GitHub Actions? Uh, what different tools are you using out there for uh, kind of CI CD? Uh, you know, what type of things are you putting in your CI pipelines? Are you doing, uh, you know, static analysis on the container images and those type of things? Feel free to come off mute, share, you know, kind of the different things you're doing. Uh, like I said, I want this to be more of a uh, interactive here. 
uh, just because uh, I know a lot of people have a lot of different ideas and how they treat uh, what their, you know, their CI pipelines and the things that they're bringing into it. Ah, so let's see. We we have a whole, all kinds of different stuff. We got Jenkins and Spinnaker and uh, we got X-Ray, Azure Repos, Jenkins. Yeah, if you've used like Azure DevOps, uh, like the Azure DevOps pipelines are very, uh, they look very much uh, kind of like uh, GitHub Actions here. Uh, is anybody out there actually using things like ConfTest and OPA within their CI pipelines? Right. So the one thing I'll show you here. So ah, I didn't push that. So within our CI pipeline, uh, the trivia scan. I solved. So I solved all these ones so that this would go through. Uh, this trivia scan. Essentially, what it does, it uh, when we use that action, it's going to download the updates from the uh, the vulnerability database and. What it's detecting in here is, if we go back, what you'll see is that we can set what that actually is going to, you can configure Trivi to say, hey, I want to, the vulnerability types, I want to look at the OS and library. Uh, so if Trivi supports whatever library you're using, uh, it will also scan and look for fixes for that too. Uh, the OS one, there's actually, I could have changed this and it would have detected uh, Ubuntu currently has like a critical vulnerability out for it. Uh, in this image, I moved to Alpine because it didn't have any vulnerabilities in here. Uh, if you're not familiar with Alpine, uh, this is using the uh, .NET Core base uh, line image here. Uh, the Alpine image, there, we publish a lot of different ones for like .NET Core in that where you may have Alpine, there's, you know, Debian based ones, Ubuntu based ones you can use. Alpine tends to be a much slimmer image. I will have to say previously Alpine had a lot of things that it had issues with uh, DNS timeouts and stuff. So uh, be careful using Alpine. Uh, I tend to use the Debian slim images. Uh, they're not much bigger than the Alpine ones. Uh, but once this happened, you can see now our integration test with Kind. Kind, it spin up a cluster here. Uh, so it pulled down the node image. You can set within Kind, you can tell it what node image you want. So if you want to test and make sure you're testing against the same API version that you're using within AKS, you can do that. Uh, you can, there's just a configuration that you set for node image and you would set this for something different. Uh, currently, I'm using like the 1.19.1 here. Uh, so if I wanted to make sure that matched up against my, you know, versions of Kubernetes I'm using out there, uh, I could do that within here. And here we'll see, I did get a failure. Uh, uh, I know why. Um, so the reason I got a failure, it wasn't able to pull this pod because I didn't set a secret uh, for my container registry. Uh, for this. Uh, but essentially what I was going through was creating the namespace and then doing the deployment of those images to, you know, test to make sure that they can get deployed. Uh, it'll give me more confidence when I get to continuous delivery to get those applications deployed out there. Uh, now, once I go through my CI pipeline, this should have triggered another job. Is this Kubernetes deployment here? This Kubernetes deployment it's just, is um, it's going to be right in here. So if I go back and look at my different workflows, this is the one it's triggering. Uh, you can see this workflow uh, runs based on uh, it's going to run whenever the CI Kubernetes one uh, is completed. Once it's completed, uh, there's also this workflow dispatch for 
uh, GitHub Actions that allows me to run these workflows manually. Uh, but in this workflow, uh, what you would probably see more in here is doing also some end-to-end -end test uh, within here. Uh, so we can check, you know, and make sure that we can hit uh, the actual service that we're deploying, uh, those type of things to uh, ensure that the image is getting deployed out uh, successfully. But this is a very kind of basic CD pipeline with GitHub Actions is, hey, I log into Azure with my Azure credentials. I set the target cluster, so I'm getting my cluster name with the resource group, passing it my credentials to connect to that, uh, and now I can run uh, the deployment uh, and give it, you know, different manifest here. Uh, I could also be deploying, you know, with Customize or Helm, whatever your tool of choice there is also. Uh, you could run those within your pipeline also. All right, so let me look at some of the questions that we may have in here now. Uh, we got some that are using Fortify. Uh, one is, can GitHub Actions do approval gates yet? Uh, I believe so. It may be a preview feature still, but there is uh, approvals that you can set uh, within GitHub Actions. Uh, but I believe it's a preview feature uh, there still. Uh, some are using Harness. Uh, cool. Any chance you can publish this GitHub workflow? Uh, yes, I will publish this GitHub workflow. Uh, the cool thing, uh, one, one other thing I should mention, now that uh, I, somebody was asking, one of the things to also look at, like from like your, you know, whether you're using GitHub Actions or some other uh, CI CD tool here, is, um, other different actions that you can use, like one that uh, can be kind of common for our customers, uh, and I think this will change once we get like auto up updates for AKS nodes out there, is that you can use like this GitHub action here. This one's set on a schedule here. Uh, you can also do workflow dispatch, which means I can run it manual. Uh, and this, what it's doing is just, we're doing an inline script to upgrade uh, all my node images here. Uh, I've not run this one, so we are going to actually, I think we should run it. See if it actually works. Uh, but when you look at automating some of these tasks, like this one, a lot of customers before, and it's not to say it was a bad direction, but a lot of people would use things like external tools like Curid, uh, you know, to do the automated reboots or uh, things like that. Uh, now you can bring some of that automation into your, your pipelines and be able to do things like your cluster node image upgrades uh, to make sure those run on a schedule. The node images, we tend to publish new node images once a week. Uh, there's not like, we don't have like an SLA that every, you know, Friday at this time that we um, are going to release a new node image, uh, but we do try to tend to get those out once a week. A new node image will contain all new updates, so like things around like even container D updates we may have, that will be baked into the node image update. Uh, so it's good to, you know, keep updated on those node image uh, updates. Let's see, this All right, so it looks like that did actually go through. Uh, so uh, just by using that, a quick script like that, uh, now I can kind of automate these tasks I may have, may have been doing manually here. Let's see. Looks like we have questions around base container images. We use Alpine Spring Boot containers. Uh, Debian compare with Alpine in terms of security. Uh, that's a good question. When choosing like your base image, uh, I think we always say go with like the slimmest image that you possibly can. Uh, I think that is good in most cases, but when you look at like Alpine versus uh, Ubuntu, uh, Alpine is definitely like some of the Debian there is like 
Debian has like slimmer image. There's like a they have one called like Slim and whatever version of Debian it uses. And there's actually one I think it's even slimmer than that. It'll be probably 20 megs bigger than like an Alpine image. I think a big thing is like Alpine uh, and like versus Debian using like the glibc libraries and that uh, are pretty standard. Uh, those are different uh, when you're talking about those kind of different base images. Uh, one of the questions also in distro list versus Alpine, uh, you know, again, it, the slimmer the image, the, you know, you're going to have a lot less uh, security vulnerabilities that are coming through. Um, that may also equal less that you're actually updating your base images. Uh, so I, I would probably always recommend try to go with slimmer images, uh, even though like, like I mentioned, like uh, the Slim Debian image, uh, I think it tends to have more vulnerabilities that you will see, not a ton more than like Alpine, uh, but Alpine being very basic and, uh, you know, removing away of a lot of what's actually in that image compared to what's in a Debian image. Uh, definitely always look at going those slimmer images if you can. Uh, options on distro lists. Uh, the distro list for like .NET Core, I know they don't have like a distro list uh, for that. Uh, I've seen a lot of people that are running things like uh, Go applications and that use like different distro list ones that are out there. Uh, I think uh, Google may even publish some of those distro list uh, uh, base images there. Uh, those are always something to look at too. Uh, I think, you know, Smaller image is the less vulnerabilities it's going to have a smaller attack service. Uh, we also have, does GitHub Actions have a self-hosted runner? Yes, uh, you can uh, provision out self-hosted run runners with GitHub Actions. Uh, there is some things in the works to run those properly in Kubernetes. Uh, right now, there's some people like, uh, some people in the community have built controllers to run those uh, within Kubernetes, meaning that it would be kind of like how you would do kind of Jenkins agents on uh, on Kubernetes, uh, where it just starts spinning up different containers. Uh, right now, you could put that self-hosted runner in a container and run it on Kubernetes, but it's going to be very static. When I need more, you know compute or resources, it's not going to automatically start spinning those up. Uh, but like I said, some people in the community have built um, kind of Kubernetes controllers to handle that, uh, and they are working on proper Kubernetes integration for self-hosted runners. Uh, best practices for getting on a node in a test cluster. Uh, this I'm, I, I, I'm I don't know if I totally understand the context here, uh, but if you do need to get like actually into a AKS node, the best I have seen is using a kubectl plugin, uh, which will do the SSH for you. Uh, makes it super simple. Uh, we have docs on how you can get into a node and like SSH into it and stuff, uh, but it's a little convoluted. If you look at the kubectl plugins, there's one for SSH. Uh, that makes it really super simple to uh, actually attach to a node. Uh, somebody posted the akschecklist.com. Uh, if you haven't checked out the AKS checklist, this is a checklist that has a lot of the different things you should really think about when you run a AKS cluster. It's not saying that you have to have all these things, but it's something that you can check out. It's called the AKS checklist. There it is. I'll put a link in here. Uh, but somebody mentioned it in the chat, so I thought I'd bring it up here. Uh, but it's essentially a checklist of different uh, areas of concern. So if we went to, let's look at security. Uh, so it'll talk about, have you checked off that, how you're storing secrets? Uh, have you implemented pod identity? Uh, all these different things that will contain security type things. Conduct Docker image builds. There's a lot of good stuff in here that you should think about. And it's not necessarily saying you have, you have to implement. It's going to be different based on your use case and environment. 
Uh, but these are really good things to really think about as you're implementing uh, Kubernetes or uh, even thinking about, you know, the different things I need to put into a uh, CI CD pipeline. Uh, so definitely check this out. Uh, yeah, I, uh, there's also a question in here. Uh, how can one use CICD systems like GitHub Actions to test for Kubernetes API changes like the new ones, the new API versions? Uh, yeah, so one of the ways you can do that is with comp test, and that's what I'm actually doing in my comp test here, uh, is I'm looking, for these APIs all here are APIs that have been deprecated. So in my CI pipeline, one of the things I check is against these deployments, a service here, that it's not using these API versions. Uh, since these are deprecated, this will break my application. Uh, like I said, you can put this in your CI pipeline, but you could also put this into something like Azure Policy for Kubernetes whenever the feature comes out that you can write custom policies, or you can use you know, the Gatekeeper implementation that allows you to do custom policies that you can start detecting these things. Uh, we even in AKS, we actually had a tab in there, so it would check your current cluster state and say if you're using any of these deprecated APIs. Uh, so these are things that you can put into your CI pipeline because what ends up happening uh, a lot of times, you can put those in your cluster, but what tends to break is that a developer or you know release engineer, they go and find off somewhere you know on Stack Overflow and they copy a deployment, like a typical deployment manifest, and it's using this old API uh, because the only difference in the new API is that it runs V1 and not the beta 2. Uh, so you want to catch those things early as possible and give like a human readable reason why it failed, not just, hey, it's a deprecated API. W well, what do I do? Uh, that's the nice thing here. I can put in this API has been deprecated, use apps v1 instead. So then as a developer or whoever's writing these ma like deployment manifests, I know exactly what I should go change. Uh, so the feedback loop is much more solid and telling me what action I should take rather than that breaking on like a when it goes to deployment and it breaks in your cluster because it's like, hey, this can't find this API. And that doesn't really tell a user like they don't know what to go do when they get an error message like that. It's like, oh, you can't find the API. What's that mean to me? Uh, this way I can give human readable uh, type feedback. Yeah, th yeah, thanks for thanks that. For that. Uh, that, uh, really that really helps. helps. I, was I was looking, looking for, something for something for existing, for existing uh, you know, deployments. Like if you already have like several hundred deployments, how to, uh, you know, just so that we don't miss. So something like an action runner that would scan through a code repository like a vulnerability scanner does. Uh, and just says, hey, these are the APAs that will break if you go from 1.18 to 1.19. Yeah, so there was, let's see. There was OPI. Because in my experience, what happens is um, while everything is documented, there will always be like out of several hundred, there would be at least like one where uh, you know the developer forgets to uh, you know make that change yeah there is yeah and that's why we usually put in the ci pipeline there's also there's also an implementation of this uh, i was hoping i could find it in a quick search but i can't uh, that somebody implemented too that was a little more uh, full featured uh, the nice thing, like using comp tests, I can just put that in a CI pipeline. Uh, this one did a little more in uh, how you could actually do that. Uh, but uh, putting in CI pipeline should help some. 
Uh, but again, like when you have so many developers out there and so many different like manifest and where they're actually getting, whether they're actually writing the manifest correctly or uh, if they pulled it off Stack Overflow, uh, like we all do probably. <laughs> uh, we all probably start somewhere. So uh, they tend to a lot of times be all over the place. And typically a developer, whoever's writing the manifest, they may not be always updated on what API changes are being made and what's going to break. Uh, I think the 1.16 was the last one with like where it removed like deployment and service objects and all those was the biggest one. Uh, for AKS where you can also do that, we also did this within it probably doesn't check anymore because I don't have a cluster that old, but in this diagnose and solve problems, there was something in cluster insight where we would uh, harvest that information. If you had anything running, uh, if you had anything running that it would do, uh, that it would give you that information with in here and tell you which workloads were running uh, deprecate or were running APIs that were deprecated. Right here, actually. Uh, this deprecated API usage check. Uh, it would um, give the information here. Uh, that's good to at least check for things that are already running uh, if you want to try to be proactive with it. Uh, let's see what else we have in here. Uh, K9s, making shelling into a node so easy. Yes, K9s is pretty cool. Uh, I haven't, so I've, if you haven't looked at K9s, uh, we're just gonna make this tool interactive. I'm just gonna search websites for you. K9s, uh, the Kubernetes CLI. Someone mentioned that it's moving to a paid thing, but uh, essentially it was a terminal UI that was beautifully made for Kubernetes and allows you to do all kinds types of different actions within the terminal UI. Uh, but I believe it's actually moving towards like a paid offering too, uh, from what I heard. So I don't know if they're removing features out of this, uh, but definitely check out K9s. I like a lot of these different interfaces, especially uh, if you prefer to be in the terminal more. K9s was like really just a really good user experience that it had. Let's see. We're concerned you to do so let's get right. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I think the self-hosted GitHub action runner is free. Uh, I don't necessarily know uh, how they uh, charge for that, but I don't believe there is. Uh, if you use the hosted runners, yeah, there's uh, whatever, there's some type of charge. And usually with like some of the, like depending on your account types, there includes a certain amount of minutes within there. Uh, question on how is Popeye? Has anybody seen Popeye? This is also a really good tool to like, uh, I think evaluate your Popeye Kubernetes. Uh, but it does a bunch of different, like, nice checks for you. Uh, so looking at this from, like, if you put your, like, deploy, your de let's say you're deploying a KCAS cluster through Terraform and your, you know, CICD system, this may be one of the steps you want to run after your cluster is up uh, to do any kind of that end-to-end -end testing. Uh, but it has a bunch of these different uh, checks that it performs in here. Uh, like you'll see ones from like nodes, namespaces, pod services, all types of different uh, built-in checks that it can uh, do for you. Uh, it's definitely a nice tool to use. Uh, I haven't used it a lot, but uh, I do have a few customers that are using it. Is there any advantage between Azure DevOps versus GitHub for private repos? Oh, that's a hard question to answer. Uh, we could probably do a whole session on that. Uh, there's a lot of differences between uh, the two and why you may want to use one or the other over there. 
Uh, and I'm probably not as familiar with that as your DevOps, so. All right. Uh, all right. Somebody also repeat a question here. What's the best approach to validate an app deployment uh, via Helm chart against gatekeeper policies without actually deploying it to the cluster and finding out issues only at that point? I'd like to discover issues earlier in the process. Uh, I think the best tool to do that is ConfTest. That's what I used in my pipeline here. So if I go to ConfTest, uh, it will, you said you're using Helm. Uh, home comp test. You can even have like your developers or like whoever's here. You can run just run this locally or in a CI pipeline, so I can catch that stuff up earlier. Uh, like my, if we go back to what mine is doing, essentially this comp test is taking what I wrote in a policy here. Is saying like we'll just take this one right here. It's saying this API's versions. If it's using any of these versions. Uh, in the in the input of API version is to then fail that and give this you know message back to the end user. Uh, so like if I had a policy like for let's say limits, uh, that's a really good one. Uh, let's say your users are not using limits and you want to set a policy that they have to set a limit. You could do that within here. Uh, you would just set whatever your policy is here. Uh, within uh, your CI pipeline, then you could go and do this little check right here. Where that is it farther down? Yeah, right here. Uh, you can check for your policy violations. Essentially, it's using ComTest and you say where your files are located. That so you could give them, you could put in your Helm chart here, and you could say, I want. The, to evaluate against my policy, whatever policies are in this policy directory. Um, and like I said, comp tests can also be ran uh, locally. So people can do that uh, even before uh, the CI pipeline. A uh, question of, is Rigo, Rigo here to stay? Uh, so Rego is, uh, I think it could be better. I think that's one of the learning curves with like OPA and the policies uh, and writing OPA policies is there's a steep, there's pretty steep learning curve with Rego. Uh, but I think what you'll find with policies and stuff that there'll be a huge library of them, just like there's a huge library of Helm charts and you'll be able to consume most using that model uh, where there's just a bunch of pre-built ones that kind of uh, work for you. Uh, but the Rego is uh, still what open policy agent will use. All right, let's see. Is there any alternative way to log into Azure DevOps CLI? Right now you can use a Uh, so is this, I guess, is the question actually using the Azure DevOps CLI, or are you asking like within like a CI pipeline of using a CLI? I think the question is the actual Azure DevOps CLI. Uh, yes, that's uh, right. Yes, that's right. Uh, you know, I'm not sure on that. Uh, I believe you you can't use a service principle yet, as far as I know. Yes, we can. So is, is there anything in plan uh, to allow that or something of that sort? Because using a pad is not the best way, right? So are we planning to implement? Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, let me, I will send a message to somebody that would know, and I'll put it back in this chat, the answer to it. Thanks. All right. Well, we are we only have <coughs> three minutes or a couple minutes left. Uh, I did want to finish up here and say thank you for you know everybody putting on all those questions and answering questions I had uh, from your environment because uh, I want to do a little something a little different this session. Uh, 
rather than present a bunch of slides in that. Uh, so as always, as uh, feel free to give us feedback, you know, topics you want to hear. Um, if you want to present on one of these calls on something, you know, that you're working on or just something in general that you want or, you know, open source, you know, cloud native technology that you've been using, uh, feel free to reach out. We are very much open for anyone and everyone to present on this call. Uh, what you think might not be cool is probably cool to most of us. Uh, I've always had that problem saying, oh, whatever I'm presenting is probably not that cool, but it actually probably is. Uh, so feel free to reach out to us if you would like to present on these calls at all. Uh, and always reach out with any feedback, uh, especially on topics. We are always looking for additional topics that you may like to hear about. Uh, those type things, please put into the chat. Uh, I do believe somebody asked what the next session is going to be about. I believe we're just confirming, but we are planning to uh, hopefully have, we had uh, app services for Kubernetes that we talked about at Build. Uh, is doing a more deep dive on that. Uh, this time, though, we will update uh, the repo and the, the topic this time, because uh, I realized I forgot to update that. So, uh, But I believe that's going to be the topic of discussion next time. Uh, so that should be fun and interesting, because it's something really new. Uh, so we'll go in and to a deep dive of uh, those services. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining today uh, and have a good week.